Hello there, and welcome to my basic guide to competitive Pokemon battling. I see many posts on the internet from people who have no idea how competitive battling works, and are usually just redirected to practicing on Showdown. Here, I hope to explain everything a person would need to know to become a competent, competitive Pokemon battler. Here is a list of contents I intend to cover in this video. If you are already familiar with some of the contents, feel free to skip ahead. So first, let's briefly go over the history of Pokemon. The first games were Red, Green, Blue, and Yellow. These games are now collectively known as the first generation, or first gen, of games. First coming out in 1996 with 151 Pokemon available, and then in the year 2000, Generation 2 came, in the form of Gold, Silver, and later Crystal. Since then we've had quite a few games and generations as seen listed here. Which brings us to Generation 8, Sword and Shield, and so far, a total of 894 known Pokemon. There are a few commonly used terms in competitive Pokemon battling. Here I have listed more common ones and their meanings. People who battle often will likely become accustomed to hearing these terms. One Hit KO, or Oko, Tank, Wall, Sweeper, Setting Up, B Box Legendary or Big Legendary, and Mythicals. Now, one of the most important things about competitive Pokemon battling is, what format? There are two main branches of competitive Pokemon battling. Smogon, a fan-implemented metagame based around single battles, and VGC, the format used at all official Pokemon tournaments, and is based around double battles. Choosing the Pokemon for the format you want to play is quite important. Some Pokemon work brilliantly in singles, but bad in doubles, and vice versa. Also, some moves are only made to have a purpose in double battles, like Helping Hand. You're going to want to tailor your Pokemon to be used in singles or double battles. So firstly, there is Stab. Basically, if a Pokemon uses a move that is the same type as itself, it'll get a same type attack bonus, doing 50% more damage than a move of a different type would. Here is an example. First, the water type Pokemon Barrascooter uses the Psychic move, Psychic Fangs. This takes about 40% of Clefable's HP. Then, Clefable heals itself back up to its full HP. And on the next turn, Barrascooter uses the water type move, Liquidation, taking about 60% HP. That is a 50% increase from Psychic Fangs, thus showing the difference that Power of Stab can make. An important game mechanic to be aware of in Pokemon is the difference between attack and special attack. Some moves do damage based on the attack stat, while others do damage based on the special attack stat. An example being Fire Punch, based on physical attack, while Flamethrower is based on special attack. You can imagine it as how many RPGs have people who fight using weapons and brute strength, and then they also have people who fight using magic. Many Pokemon specialize in one of the offensive move sets so it's best to become familiar with your Pokemon's stats, so you can choose the best attack suited for it. You can see whether a move is physical or special when you look at the move's category. Here, we can see that Acid Spray has the special move category symbol, while Knock Off has the physical symbol. The other category of moves, alongside the physical and special moves, is known as Status Moves. Status moves are often ignored by competitive players, since they do no direct damage. However, if used correctly, they can greatly turn the tide of a battle. Stat boosting moves, for example, can make some mundane Pokémon formidable sweepers, capable of one-hit KOing an entire team of six, where, if they had not set up such a stat boost, such a thing would be impossible. Here is a quick demonstration of stat boosting power. In this first scenario, Poltergeist, Oh, Poltegeist, sorry, goes straight for the offensive move Giga Drain, which does approximately 65% damage, and with the health absorbed, it is able to survive the next hit and finish off the Purloin. However, when the next Pokemon comes in, it gets outsped. In comes Chandelure aptly named Shanda, and is finished off by the Shadow Ball, since Chandler has a much higher base speed than Poltergeist. In the second scenario, Poltergeist uses the status move Shell Smash. 
effectively doubling its speed and offensive stats. With these stat boosts, it is able to begin sweeping the opponent's team. Gaining the HP back with Giga Drain, and doing heavy damage with its Stab Shadow Ball. Boom. This time, instead of only taking down one Pokemon, it is able to shred through the opponent's team. We see this Pokemon was holding a Focus Sash, so it was just able to survive our hit. Hits us with a super effective attack back, but Poltergeist was able to survive that pretty easily. Went for that little bit of HP recovery there. And in comes good boy. Or should we say, goodbye. Because with a stab Shadow Ball at plus two, there is no way it can survive. So, Poltegeist has been able to shred through four of the opponent's Pokémon so far. Compared to the first battle where it was only able to defeat one, we can see that the, the power of the stat boost here is definitely a plus. The key to such a tactic is knowing the appropriate time to boost, like when you are fairly certain your opponent will switch out, or the opponent's Pokémon poses no threat, or you've lowered your opponent's key offensive stats, perhaps by bringing in a Pokémon with the ability Intimidate. Inflicting stats conditions can also be greatly beneficial, since you can reduce an opponent's attack, or speed, or stop them from being able to attack, or make it so that after a certain amount of turns they will faint. There are hundreds of other stats moves that can be beneficial to certain situations, like Trick Room or Follow Me. It's best to watch battle videos or read move descriptions to learn when is best to use them. Another important game mechanic to be aware of is abilities. All Pokemon have abilities. Some can greatly benefit a Pokemon, while others can hinder it severely. Some abilities, like Levitate, provide an immunity from an attacking type. Others, like Tough Claws or Iron Fist, can boost the power of certain attacks. Sometimes the same species of Pokemon can have different abilities. It's always best to research your Pokemon's possible abilities and choose the best one for it. One of the most important aspects of competitive battling is becoming familiar with all 18 types of Pokemon. Here is a brilliant type chart made by someone on Reddit back in Generation 6, which is still applicable for Generation 8. I will provide a link to this image in the description of the video. Learning the type chart feels like an ever ongoing process. There have been many times in battles where I find myself struggling to remember something like if rock resists bug, but knowing as much as you can will certainly help. Now we can move on from the basics and talk about what makes a Pokemon good for competitive battling. These four points are the most important factors in determining how good a Pokemon will be at battling. Typing, base stats, move pool, and ability. Let's start with typing. A grass bug type with six weaknesses as opposed to say an electric flying type with only two weaknesses is going to automatically put a Pokemon at a disadvantage. However, if a Pokemon has a bad typing, they may have other factors to make up for it. Next, there are base stats. Most Pokemon have a unique mix of base stats, some higher than others. Jolteon, for example, has 130 base speed, while Weezing has only 60 base speed. Weezing won't be useful in situations where speed is key, but Weezing's base defense is 120, while Jolteon's is 60. So, Weezing is much more likely to survive a physical hit than Jolteon. It's also worth noting that the only way to see a Pokémon's base stats is on a website such as Cerebi.net or Pokémon Database. Whether a Pokémon will be good for your competitive team depends on the stats it has and the roles it plays on the team, a speedy attacker or a defensive wall. I'll leave a link to a brilliant comic by Reddit user Bomadude Comics that explains Pokémon's stats in the video's description. Next, Move Pool can play an important part of how well a Pokémon is able to perform. Take Nidoking for example. While it does get some decent physical moves, it has a wider variety of special moves that work with its power boosting ability Sheer Force, and thus Nidoking was overwhelmingly used as a good special attacker in previous generations. Finally, we have abilities. As mentioned on the abilities slide, some abilities can make a Pokémon very powerful, like Blaziken's speed boost, while others can hinder a Pokémon's ability to battle, such as Slacking's Truant ability. Some abilities can provide a Pokémon with a niche that needs filling, giving it a critical role on a team, like Espeon's hidden ability Magic Coat, 
which allows it to reflect any hazards, like Stealth Rock or Toxic, back at the Pokémon using them, and is thus a hazard deterrent. Now we move on to what some may describe as the most confusing aspect of competitive Pokémon training, the three main factors that influence stats. Natures, individual values, or IVs, which can also be known as individual strengths, and effort values, known as EVs. Natures. All Pokémon have natures. Bold, timid, careful, brave, etc. There are 25 different natures. Each of the natures increases one stat by 10% and decreases another by 10%. Some increase and decrease the same stat and thus cancel out the effect. I'll leave a link to a chart in the description showing all the Pokémon natures and their effects. IVs. Each of the stats of a newly hatched or captured Pokémon is based on a hidden scale from 0 to 31. A Pokémon with a 0 IV in a stat will have the lowest potential stat number possible for its species and level, while a Pokémon with a 31 IV will have the potential to have the highest possible stat number for its species and level. Seeing your Pokémon's IVs used to be impossible in-game, but in Generation 6 they added a character who would judge how good your Pokémon's stats slash IVs were. In the current Generation 8, they improved upon this by adding a function to the Pokémon PC where you can see a description of each of the stats, telling you how good they are. Here, we see two level 1 Snom. Their stats are fairly similar, with only a 1 point difference in the special attack. But now, with the Judge function, let's see how these Pokémon's IVs compare. So, as we can see, the first Snom has mainly decent stats, with 2 being a little better with the summary screen stating that its stats are okay, while the second Snom mostly has best in its stats, meaning those are the highest on the scale they can be, with the summary stating it has amazing stats. At low levels, IVs don't influence the stats much, as seen here by Snom, but let's see how they can influence stats on higher level Pokémon, with a Lapras I caught swimming around the lake in a wild area, versus a Lapras I caught in a raid den. As we can see, Despite being the same level, the Lapras that has best in most of its stats has much higher stats than the Lapras whose stats are only decent. So, with the higher the IVs, the higher the stats. EVs are hidden points that Pokémon can gain which add up to give their stats a boost. You may have heard years ago that a Pokémon leveled up with Rare Candy won't have as good stats as a Pokémon you've leveled up through battling. This is because Pokémon leveled up with Candy do not gain EVs, while Pokémon that have leveled up through battling do. Unlike the old days, you can now easily EV train a Pokémon after leveling up with Candy. A Pokémon can only gain a maximum of 510 EV points, and only 252 per stat. They have been around as we know them since Generation 3. In Generation 8, when on a Pokémon summary screen, if you press the X button, it'll show you a graph of your Pokémon's EV points. Here, you can see the difference between two Charizard. One which has battled lots of random Pokémon, acquiring many random EVs. And another which has had its EVs trained into specific stats. The sparkling effect means that the stat is maxed out for the EV points, while the one which gained random EVs in all of its stats has higher defenses, it has significantly lower speed and special attack. Charizard's two best stats. This highlights the difference that specific EV training can make. So, it is through a combination of the natures, the IVs, and the EVs that a Pokémon can gain its highest possible stats and therefore be ready to go online and fight against opponents with the best chance of winning. Here are the essentials you will need to make IV breeding a breeze. A 6 IV or a 5 IV ditto, the item Destiny Knot for ensuring the offspring inherit some of the IVs from the parents, and the item Everstone for passing a specific nature to the offspring. Also, some Pokémon can learn great moves, but only if one of their parents knew the move, so it's best to check a website like Cerebi.net to learn what egg moves your Pokémon could learn. In Sword and Shield, this was expanded so that egg moves can be taught to other Pokémon while spending time in the nursery with a member of the same species who knows the egg moves. For example, one Cinderace with egg moves, if placed in the nursery with another Cinderace without egg moves, could teach the one without egg moves 
the egg moves, providing that the one without the egg moves has some empty move slots. As for how you EV train, in Generation 8 there are three different ways. The first is the old method of battling various species of Pokemon, e.g. defeating Maractus, will gain your Pokemon special attack EVs. The amount of EVs you gain can be increased by having the Pokemon hold a power item such as the Power Lens and being infected with the Pokerus virus. The advantage to this method is that it doesn't cost any in-game money or BP, and you can train multiple Pokemon at once. Next, there are Poker Jobs, specifically at the seminars. At the Rotomi PC in the Pokemon Center, you can send your Pokemon to specific seminars to increase a particular stat. The EVs gained are also increased by the Power Items and Pokerus. It takes 24 hours to fully train a stat if using the items and Pokerus. The advantage to seminars is that all you have to do is wait and it does it for you. Lastly, and by far the most efficient method of EV training, is buying vitamins and feeding them to your Pokemon. HP up, protein, iron, calcium, zinc, and carbos. These items give you 10 EVs in a given stat. In past games you were limited to only using 10 of these items on a Pokemon, but in Gen 8 this limit was removed, and now we can max out a Pokemon stats using them. E.g. 26 protein should give your Pokemon 260 EVs, but since a Pokemon can't have more than 252 EVs in a stat, 26 vitamins will only give it 252 EVs. So, you could for example use 26 protein and 26 carbos to give a Pokemon 504 EVs. Then for the last 6 EVs, you could give it one other vitamin. If maxing out 2 stats on a Pokemon, it is important to use the 26 each first, and then the one other vitamin last, as if you use the other one first, it will take up 10 EVs, while if you use it last, it will only fill up the remaining 6 EVs, as all the others are being used. With vitamins, EV training can be completed in seconds. The vitamins, however, do cost a lot of in-game money. Buying 26 in the Pokemon Center in Wyndon will cost 260,000 Poké Dollars. Fully EV training one Pokemon will cost 530,000 Poké Dollars, and EV training a full team of six, 3,180,000 Poké Dollars. However, with the recent addition of the Isle of Armor, if you give the Dojo Master's wife, Honey, lots of watts, she will add a vending machine to the dojo that gives out vitamins for much cheaper than those bought in Wyndham, with 26 costing 130,000, bringing the total price of EV training a Pokemon down to 280,000. And in Sword and Shield, they have introduced quite an easy method of maxing out the in-game money. As we see here, I am buying vitamins at the dojo, buying 25 of each, and I know I already have one extra of the others. But let's buy one of those other iron there to boost this Pokemon's defense. And now I'm going to go ahead and use them on the Snorlax. So we go to our bag, which we have organized by uh, type, and we go down to where the vitamins are. So I can use 26 of these proteins straight away on this Snorlax, and then 26 of the HP up, which are above 70. So yeah, 26 HP up, so that's maximum uh, HP and maximum attack EVs, and then the last EVs, we'll just put them into defense with the iron. And if we quickly go into summary here, we can see that, yes, HP and attack are maxed. And yes, as I said, while this method is expensive, they have introduced a quite easy method of maxing out in-game money. It is also worth noting that if you have a Pokemon that already has EVs, you can remove the EVs by feeding it specific berries such as Hondu or Grepa, which remove 10 EVs at a time. Or, you can also speak to a woman on a small patch of sand in the sea near the dojo on the Isle of Armor who will remove all the EVs a Pokemon has in exchange for Armorite ore. I already have a video on my YouTube of me doing this method. To max out your in-game money, you can farm and hoard a load of watts. Once you've beaten the game's story, whenever you check a raid den with a Pokemon inside, you are given 2,000 watts. Once you have around 90,000 watts, you can buy 999 luxury balls, 
from one of the seven wild area vendors, dressed in white, found around the wild area. What balls they sell changes every day. Then, you can sell those 999 luxury balls at a Pokemon Center or a nearby train station. For 1,498,500 Poké Dollars, which is just under 15% of the maximum amount of money you can have. So thus, money can be maxed out quite easily, ma making the vitamin method of Eevee training the most efficient by far. So maybe you now understand how to make a perfect Pokémon, but how should you train it? Well, that is up to you, but you should probably work with your Pokémon's strengths. First, look at the Pokémon you want to use on a website like Cerebi or Smogon to see its base stats and what moves it can learn. Umbreon, for example, has low attack, special attack, and speed. So, offensively, even if you get the perfect IVs, EVs, and train it to the max, it won't be hitting very hard. However, its HP, defense, and special defense are all quite high. This, along with recovery moves, suggests that investing into Umbreon's defensive stats would be far more beneficial than its offensive ones. As for how Umbreon would fight opponents with its very low offensive stats, well, there are workarounds for that. Toxic, for example. The move Toxic inflicts a kind of poison whose damage at the end of each turn increases exponentially, essentially putting the Pokémon on a timer. Also, the move Foul Play, which ignores whatever the attack stat is, and uses the opponent's attack stat to do damage with instead. So, if a powerful attacker like Metagross comes in, or if someone has boosted their attack by using Dragon Dance, for example, Foul Play will do tons of damage. Also, you can check websites like Smogon or Picolytics, which have very good general analyses of most Pokémon, which can help point you in the best training direction. Since Generation 2, Pokémon have been able to hold items. Some items can greatly help a Pokémon. As to what items are good to use, that'll often depend on the way you've trained a Pokémon. For example, a bulky Umbreon would appreciate an item that can restore HP, such as Leftovers or a Berry. Or it might appreciate an item that does damage when hit by physical attacks, such as Rocky Helmet, thus dissuading physical attacks. There is plenty of room for experimentation with items. One thing to note though is that some items have no effect when held, such as a potion. A potion is an item that must be used on a Pokémon, not held by one. However, if an item can't be held, there is often equivalent items that can be, like berries that can restore HP or cure status conditions. So read the item's descriptions and find out what they do. See what items are commonly suggested for Pokémon. In many battles I've come across people whose Pokémon aren't holding any items because they couldn't think of what to give them. Almost any item is better than none. When in doubt, I suggest use berries. Since Generation 6, each generation has introduced some new mechanic to Pokémon battles. Gen 6 brought Mega Evolution, Gen 7 brought Z-moves, and Gen 8 brought the Dynamax phenomenon. As far as when this guide was produced, Mega Evolution and Z-moves are absent from the Generation 8 games, but I will cover them briefly in case they return in DLC. Mega Evolution Certain Pokémon when holding species-specific items known as Mega Stones were able to transform during battle, getting a substantial increase to their base stats, and sometimes changing their ability, and even changing their type. Z-Moves Pokémon holding an item and possessing a move of the item's type, such as Rockium Z and Stone Edge, were able to enhance that move into Continental Crush a one-time use super move for battle. These moves would have 100% accuracy and extra base power. They would also give status moves an additional effect. Darkinium Z, for example, would give Hone Claws an extra attack boost, along with its normal attack and accuracy boost. In the current Generation 8, the gimmick is Dynamaxing. Almost all Pokémon when in the Galar region are capable of Dynamaxing during battle. When Pokémon Dynamax, they become visually much larger and their HP increases. If a Pokémon's Dynamax level has been maxed out, then when Dynamaxed, their HP value will be doubled from what it is normally. All status moves become Max Guard, and offensive moves become Max Moves, each having a different effect which I will list here on the slide. Certain Pokémon are capable of Gigantamaxing, 
Like Dynamaxing, they appear large and are capable of using max moves. However, moves of a certain type will become G-Max moves, like Leon's Gigantamax Charizard. Its fire moves become G-Max Wildfire instead of Max Flare, which creates residual damage at the end of each turn for a few turns. Listed here on the slide are all known Pokemon, capable of Gigantamaxing, though it is likely more will be added in the DLC. It is also worth noting that only certain individual Pokemon can Gigantamax, such as Leon's Charizard, but not all Charizard will automatically Gigantamax. In Generation 2, they introduced the concept of entry hazards. Certain moves throw hazards across the battlefield, so whenever a Pokemon is switched in, they take damage. Here, I have detailed the five different kinds of entry hazards as of Generation 8. Stealth Rocks and Spikes do actual damage, while Toxic Spikes inflicts poison, and Sticky Web lowers the speed of Pokemon switching in. The other new entry hazard is set up when Co Copperaja Gigantamaxes and uses the move G-Max Steel Surge, which sets up Steel Shards around the battle. It works the same way as Stealth Rock. Hazards are a lot more common in full single battles where switching is commonplace. Most single teams will have either a Pokemon with the move Rapid Spin, Defog, or Court Change to try and remove hazards. If you are able to feint your opponent's Rapid Spinner or Defogger, then your team will have the advantage. While a Pokemon's speed stat is usually what determines who goes first in a battle, there are certain moves which will go first ignoring the speed stat. These are known as priority moves. The vast majority of moves have a priority ranking of 0, meaning that when they attack is dependent on a Pokemon's speed. The move Quick Attack, however, will ignore a Pokemon's speed stat and go first, unless an opponent has gone for a priority move like Quick Attack. In that case, whoever has the higher speed stat will be taken into account. Conversely, there are moves with negative priority, meaning they will go last, even if the Pokemon using the move is very fast. On this slide here is a list of all moves that are po prioritized positively and negatively. It is worth noting that in Psychic Terrain, priority moves targeting opponents will fail to work, unless targeting a flying type or a levitating target. Weather has been in the game since Generation 2. There are currently four different types of weather that can affect the battlefield. Some power up moves, others do passive damage each turn. There are many weather dependent abilities, such as Sand Rush, Slush, Chlorophyll, Swift Swim, and far too many to list here. Many teams can be built around the use of a particular weather. Some Pokemon have an ability which summons weather to the battle as they are switched in, such as Ninetales with its drought ability summoning the sunlight, and Alolan Ninetales with its snow warning ability summoning the hail. Terrains were introduced in Generation 6, where they were rarely used since their benefits were quite limited and only a few Pokemon had access to the moves which could create them. In Generation 7, the legendary Tapus of the Alola region were notoriously used in battles to set up terrain, and in Generation 8, some new Pokemon with the terrain setting abilities have been introduced. Thus, terrains have become a much more popular aspect of gameplay. They often boost the power of the type they represent, as well as having another aspect, such as preventing status or preventing priority moves. It is a good idea to become familiar with the effects of the terrains. Next, I should mention some of the key differences between singles and double battles. As far as moves go, there are quite a few moves that are useless in single battles, such as Wide Guard, Helping Hand, or Ally Switch, either failing or having no effect. It's a good idea to read a move's description when you first encounter it. Also, many moves that work alright in single battles become vastly better in double battles, such as Protect. You could potentially do damage to the opponent, while they do no damage to you because they targeted the Pokémon that protected. Fake Out is also great because you can force one of your opponent's Pokémon to flinch, while your other Pokémon can do heavy damage or set up. Since in double battles where four Pokémon are present on the field at once, much more happens per turn. This often makes double battling much quicker than single battles, where switching is vital to stay alive and get into a good position. This fast-paced double style greatly benefits the use of moves like Trick Room, Tailwind, Reflect, or Weather moves like Rain Dance, since more can happen while the moves are in effect, essentially making them last longer. Another thing to note is that Hazard moves are rarely used in double battles, while in single battles they are almost omnipresent. In VGC specifically, where only four Pokémon are used in the double battle format, switching is quite limited and sometimes isn't even necessary. So, 
using a turn to set up an entry hazard is usually much better spent boosting stats or inflicting actual damage, and as a result they are almost never seen in VGC. So, given all this information, can you win using your favourite Pokemon? Maybe. Teams need to be balanced well in order to survive in the competitive scene. What I often do is use one or two of my favourites on a team, then fill the rest out with bulky Pokemon, or Pokemon that counter those to which my favourites are weak. As I mentioned on the slide here, if your favourite Pokemon is Charizard, best bring a Pokemon that would resist rock, and some with either Defog or Rapid Spin. In single battles, Switching to take less damage from an attack is quite important, so having bulky Pokemon who can take hits well is very important. I find it much more satisfying winning with Pokemon I like, as opposed to those which are simply more powerful. Learning how to battle efficiently involves a lot of trial and error. The more you'll battle, the more you'll become accustomed to various species of Pokemon and how fast they are, and if you can survive a hit. In one of my earliest battles here, I learned that Raichu are very fast and can learn Fake Out which broke my Focus Sash, and then since he was faster, was able to take me out without my poor Smeagol ever getting a move off. Ever since that battle I learned an important lesson, Raichu often have Fake Out and are naturally faster than Smeagol. Also, learning to predict what your opponent will do will be greatly beneficial. For example, if an opponent leads with Venusaur and you lead with Charizard, it is likely they will switch out to avoid fire, so it is best to use a flying type move, so that if they switch in something that resists fire, like water, you will still do effective damage. You can also rent teams from people who display their team codes. Many YouTubers and high-ranking VGC players upload their teams for people to try out. Another great resource to help practice battling is Pokemon Showdown, a battle simulation website where fans have created a hierarchy of Pokemon split into tiers based on their usage on the website, and occasionally their strength. On the site, you can build teams quickly and test them out against other players quickly, compared to breeding a team in the actual game. One thing though, all battles are conducted on a ladder system, whereby you gain a score or lose a score depending on how you do. This encourages more people to play to win, so having slightly more relaxed battles with a variety of Pokemon can be difficult to come by except for low-scored, inexperienced players. Here are some links to some great resources for competitive battling. I will also put these in the video's description, along with other links to various things I've mentioned in the video. Thank you for watching, and I hope my explanations can help you become a great battler, whether you're a hardy VGC veteran, an adamant Smogonite, or a relaxed casual player. Please share this with anyone who you think might benefit from it, and thanks for watching. I'd also like to thank my friend Donna, helping me put some of these battles together.